Uh, thank you guys for joining us today. And we are sitting down with uh, Michelle, Amory, Pam, and Elvis, some emerging actors out here in LA. And first of all, I just want to uh, thank uh, Pae Beer for sponsoring this event. Uh, we yes. hopefully, yes, <laughs> it's delicious uh, premier beer. So thank you so much uh, for supporting uh, the Hmong community and sponsoring this event. So we want to thank you guys tremendously for this and uh, make sure to get some pay beer if you if it's in your neighborhood get it and celebrate Christmas or the new year is coming but be safe wear your mask and six feet distance guys um, so I'm just gonna uh, introduce you guys the panel and just wave your hand and then we can start into the Q&A's for you guys so I want to introduce uh, Michelle Yang hi hi everyone uh, Amri Tao. Hi. Pam Hyung. And Elvis. <laughs> All right, guys. So um, let's get started into this panel. Um, what got you guys uh, into acting? Um, let's start with Michelle. Yeah, um, I got into acting when I was little. So I think I was like in kindergarten and I saw these third graders put on this performance um a play and i just thought it was so magical how you could be a different character you could dress up and um you could tell a story so ever since i was five i've i've been into it ever since and doing theater and uh commercial print work and all that stuff so um i just love storytelling and the impact that it has on the audience and it's quite a powerful tool so um i love acting so much so where, where did you live, where did you grow up? So I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and um, I am a registered nurse, and uh, I decided to do a career change. So I moved out to LA about a year ago. So I'm a new actor, <laughs> and so uh, it's been quite the journey, but, and COVID has definitely slowed it down for me, but um I still, every day I wake up every day, I still want to, I still want to act. I still want to do it. So I'm here. <laughs> Emery, how about yourself? What got you into acting? Um, my dad got me into acting. He made a Hmong movie when I was seven and put me and my brother in it. So we had like 15 seconds of fame. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but you know, when you're at that age, you don't really think about it something you want to do for the rest of your life um and then when i was a teenager uh i just remember watching buffy the vampire slayer with the family growing up and i had this thought pop into my mind of like i don't even know what scene it was it was on i just remember thinking i could do better than that and my mom was like all right go ahead I don't think she like wanted me to actually do it at the time, but she was like, okay, if you think you could do better, <laughs> go do it. And so that always stuck in the back of my mind. And then uh, here I am now. <laughs> and where are you originally from? Uh, I was born in Ottawa, Illinois, but I grew up mostly in Merced, California. Okay. And how about you, Pam? What got you started in uh, acting? I think I was first uh, and foremost uh, a singer or a performer and so I'd been on stage for quite some time, um, been singing for a long time and then I was cast, uh, my first like film film project, I was cast in um, actually a Hmong film, Kang Vang's um, uh, first film and uh, after that I decided to take classes and ended up really enjoying it and ended up starting getting a local agent um, to Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota at the time and booking local work there before uh, coming all the way out here. So that's kind of what got me started, yeah. So, you, so you're from Minnesota. What part of Minnesota are you from? Twin Cities, St. Paul, yep. So right here. in the middle. <laughs> How about you, Elvis? What got you into performing or acting? Because we all know you start, you did, uh, you did Grand Trino and you know, you, you're well known as a rapper. So uh, what got you starting into acting? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. So I'm just gonna say, I mean, sure, complete luck, you know, uh, which, which, you know, opportunity makes preparation. But, you know, my, my, my story is similar to Pam's, you know, 
Uh, I think there's so many avenues in this career field of the arts and everything kind of just complements each other, you know, so went from rapping to, you know, singing to, you know, speaking and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, you, you, you hit the stage and there's acting and things just come and, you know, as long as you're prepared for the opportunities, you're always moving, you're always growing. Uh, yeah, I kind of just bumped into it, you know, I got a big opportunity, of course, with Grant Torino. And then I had kind of had to relearn the industry because I was still very brand new, but got an opportunity that most people won't get. And so it was a very confusing uh, place to be in because I had to kind of like figure out, you know, who I was from there. And so I kind of had to work backwards. And where take where are you originally from, Elvis? Yeah, so Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin as well. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, moved my endeavors out to Chicago, and then I've been in LA now for two years. So it was, it was kind of been moving all over the place. It's been a journey. Cool. So this is going to so be great. a general general question for all of you guys, and you guys just kind of uh, decide who wants to uh, go first. And so, what what hustle or struggle or taking classes or if you guys went to acting school or what side jobs uh, you guys are having right now to you know to get to this point of your career? from beginning to already, you know, marinating in the industry out here in LA, like what, uh, what, tell, tell the audience, like your struggle and, you know, any pinpoint of, you know, first of all, you have to take classes and your hustle and, you know, being different, uh, being among ethnicity in this industry. So, um, Emery, you want to start off first? Uh, sure. I think, my biggest struggle was just gaining momentum. Uh, what, and it, my, my, my path's a little different too because I went to, to film school. Um, and originally to become a director and then um, once I graduated, it was right during the recession and the trend in entertainment at the time was reality TV and that's where all the jobs were. And so I did, I did an internship and kind of got my first job that way and it worked a bunch of reality TV gigs. And then after doing that for a while, I realized that I wasn't doing what I came out to LA to do. Um, I, I, I mean, I did it just did all that just to get experience, but then I was like, it's not, after a while I was like, I really miss acting. And um so, and I had always done it on the side. Like I was like secretly going out and auditioning while I was doing my reality TV gigs. Um, but it's not something you can do half-ass. You have to do it <laughs> like full-ass. <Yeah. laughs> um, it is, it is a, a business and you have to treat it like it's your business. Um, and I think that's the biggest struggle, was the biggest struggle for me was really just like taking the step to go 100% all in and uh you know knock away all the bullshit <laughs> <laughs> pam how about yourself you, you kind of gave us like you started in minnesota but out here in la what what is your struggle and your hustle to to get to where you're at today you know i think that the struggle for me definitely is um is that it, for me personally, is that I'm also a mother, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I acting was in something that I could never really have the luxury to fully dive into because I always had the responsibility of being a parent and that always came first and I was always very focused on that. Um, and then because of that, survival is also really important and making sure that you're providing a good life and a good home and so, um, it, that is def it's exactly like what Amory said, though, with this industry, you really have to, um, treating it like a side gig is only ever going to get you so far. You really have to go all in because it really is, um, you know, to, if you really, really want to do it, it really is a full-time commitment. And I think that's the, the toughest part, especially in a place like LA, is surviving, you know, trying to make sure you can pay your rent and keep a roof over your head, and then also being able to do it full-time. And it's, it's a very non-traditional type of work. Whereas if you've, you've got to find a way to make money and support yourself while you're at it. And then classes cost money. Um, networking events cost money in headshots cost money, you know, promotional stuff costs money. And it's, it's actually a pretty 
expensive um, career path to choose because you really do have to fully invest in it in a lot of different ways. And I think that's the hardest part is balancing the financial aspect of being an actor with, with actually be with actually you know acting acting and and you know when you're starting out acting acting really isn't going to bring in a lot of money so it's a lot of out-of-pocket stuff going in at first so for michelle how do you balance being a uh traveling nurse during covid and like well, what is your struggle you know to to this point i know you just took in headshots and uh you know so like what what got you to that point or or mm -hmm. you know the future in a sense yeah, so I think um, right now it's just kind of finding the perfect job for me um, as a RN to be able to still practice my nursing license, but still be able to be an actor. So I actually, um, I started a new contract with one of the top hospitals here in LA County. And so hopefully I'll get hired there um, in, as a permanent position um, as a per diem nurse. So this way I can work whenever I want. You know, I can pick and choose my schedule so I can go to auditions, you know, Monday through Friday, perhaps, but then maybe work a shift or two on the weekend. So I have a lot of um, autonomy with my schedule and um, that'll give me the freedom to still have like to still pursue my acting career full time, but also be financially stable. Um, and so I think that gives me a sense of relief, but also my parents a sense of relief as well. Um, you know, because being among, among daughter or just among um, child, you know, we come from parents that escaped war and genocide, you know, so like the, the one thing that they really want for us is financial stability after all that they've been through, you know, so once I had established that in my nursing career with um, my family, you know, they, they have been really supportive. So I'm just kind of trying to figure it out and find the balance still. And so I think once I get that situated, you know, I can really dive deep into my acting career. And plus COVID is slowing things down like crazy. So, so Elvis, how about yourself? What, what is your struggle? Uh, you know, t you know, what did you learn through after Grand Trino and your struggle of you know, reestablishing re who you are as an artist, an actor, a rapper, and, you know, and are you taking classes or what's your side jobs to, to make sure you stay afloat in LA? Yeah, I, I'm going to flip the conversation a little bit. And, you know, a friend of mine gave me this advice a long time ago, you know, I just never really listened. And she said, you are an artist second and you're an entrepreneur first, right? And so, uh, you know, I, I didn't look at it that way, but, you know, at some point I take that very personal. Um, and, and because, you know, what I call the in-between, those pockets of time where we're not doing anything, stuff is slow, like right now, you know, if we don't have other things, not, not to settle for a plan B, because that would never be the case for me. I've been in the game for 20 years, right? But there's been moments where I thought I had nothing to fall back on, you know, as far as to pick me back up, to continue and, you know what I mean? and not have to, you know, wait tables or deliver, you know, um, uh, uh, groceries and things like that, you know. So at some point I just made up my mind, you know, that not only am I gonna manage my career, I'm gonna manage my money, financial advisor, whoever I gotta hire to cover these, uh, you know, uh, gains that I'm not getting. And so to me, you know, I, I got like five, six different side hustles right now. You know, they say the average millionaire has seven different incomes, right? So I, I, I you know, we know as Hmong, you know, actors that our opportunities are limited. You know, uh, to me, I mean, I, as long as I'm me, uh, you know, uh, genuinely and authentically, I, you know, I, I like my odds regardless. You know, I just know that it takes time. We have to be a little more patient. Our opportunities are more limited, but that doesn't mean we give up. We go home and pack up. That just means we have to stay occupied, you know, with our time here. And uh, we just got to be uh, smarter about what we do. And so to me, I've just been focusing more on, you know, how do I uh, stay busy, not have anxiety so that, you know, we or you know, we feel like we're always falling and need to pick ourselves up. So in times like these are very, you know, a testament of like, you know, are we able to pull through all this? And so I think the fact that we're all here together, you know, talking about this is a, is, is a good look for, you know, our future. So, yeah. So what, so let's talk about stereotypes in Hollywood. Like uh, it, it's up to anybody who wants to jump in on this. Uh, how do you guys face stereotypes or, or uh, uh, finding your type, like w being typecasted, and w what's your viewpoint on that? 
Anne Marie, you want to start with Pam or Michelle? Uh, well, that's a funny question because I never, never really knew what my type is. Like I would be in an uh, when I was taking my audition techniques class, uh, my teacher. That was one of the things my teacher stressed and like, she, you know, she could easily pinpoint everybody's types. But whenever it came to me, she was always like, you're unique. And to me, I was like, what, what does that mean? Um, and part of that, I feel like is because representation for a lot of Asian actors just hasn't been there. So people don't have, haven't seen, you know, a lot of Asian people on screen. So that they're the only idea of what I could play was limited to uh, a nerdy Mickey Rooney type caricature. Um, yeah, and even, uh, so I met with a bunch of agents uh, at the beginning of this year. And, you know, the, uh, the idea of type always comes up in these meetings. And in one of the meetings, um, the agent was like, you have great headshots and you could go out for a lot of like thug type roles, but then I see you in person and you're not that. And I'm like, we, of course I'm not, I'm not what my picture is. Um, but I know that because I have these pictures, these are the, these, I could easily be called in for these type of roles. And that, and then that's when I could like show them my acting. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's a tough, the whole idea of like type is based on on movie tropes that already exist and so when there hasn't been a whole lot of media for that portrays us then it's hard to say what your type is necessarily i mean sure yeah. i could play a thug or whatever because of my shaved head but there's a whole plethora of other things that we can explore uh, pam or elvis or michelle you guys want to add to that I think type has been, um, I, I will say that I have all of the things that I have booked um, have been specifically cast for an Asian, right? So I've never really booked anything that was one of those like all ethnicities, unless it was background work, then, you know, it didn't really matter. But the roles that I've booked have always been specifically Asian or they're really looking for an Asian. Um, even when you're in like a um, in a commercial and there was a bunch of people, I was always like, okay, here's the international market. And so um, there's been booking with that. And, and kind of like Amory, my type is also really difficult. And it's difficult because when you see me and you meet me and you see me in photos, you, for me, age is the bigger issue, I think, um, than actually being Asian because, um, people are thinking, oh, they would never, you would never think to book me as like a mom role until you know that I am one. And then all of a sudden everybody's thinking, I want to book you for this mom role. But then physically, if I had to compete with other moms for a mom role, I will never get the role. <laughs> because physically, I just won't look it. Um, but then that's what they're always thinking. And, and I think I find that age is the, mo the most difficult thing for me. My size and my overall look is, is younger but then my personality and like the way I carry myself and everything is a little bit older. So it's kind of like Amory where like you think that I'm something and then you meet me in person and then I'm something else. Um, it's a little bit different. And so, yeah, it's, it's a lot harder to, to cast a type cast in that way. But for me, I think the easiest way to look at myself is I'm always going to be a good office worker. I'm always going to be like, you know, a good, um, probably like secretary or receptionist. So like office types, if they're doing business, business castings, those are always going to look good. Um, everything else you kind of have to fight a little bit for. Uh, I have been told that I can do uh, rom-coms. So I've never thought of myself that way as doing that. And you wouldn't think that as an, and this is the sad part, but you wouldn't think that like as an Asian girl people would look at you as the lead in a rom-com right because <laughs> that's really far far you're always going to play like the best friend or something and I had somebody tell me that one time too like you would make like the fun crazy best friend um, because they don't see you as the lead 
you know, and they're not going to look at you as the lead in, in those types of films. And so that's one thing that you have to look at. But I think it's, it's slowly changing. It's slowly changing. But that is definitely the thing is that it's hard to, to, you have to understand that starting out, you just have to give up the, uh, you just have to accept the idea that it's going to take a while for the industry to see you in a lead role. So this question is uh, for Pam and Michelle. And the, the reason why I, I wanted to have bring two Hmong women on this panel is, you know, what are, what are the positive and negative effect of, you know, being Hmong women and moving away from your family and not getting married or did get married and, you know, have a kid and coming out to LA to pursue this career? Like, what was that struggle? And how did the patriarch system uh, system in the Hmong community affected you emotionally or, you know, uh, so if you guys could kind of touch base on that from a, from a woman's perspective, and because I know there's a lot of uh, Hmong women out there that do want to pursue acting out in LA or New York or Atlanta or Chicago. So if you could kind of shine a light of your positive and also negative effect of the community, your family, and just being a Hmong woman. Yeah, I think um, for me i you know taking the the leap out here that was one of the big barriers that i had to face um because you know as a Hmong woman uh, um i i don't know what your experience is as Hmong actors as men but for me i i think in my experience i have a lot of people that maybe perhaps have more doubt in me and my ambitions in coming out here because i am a woman um, but it was just sorting out that and figuring out, you know, with life experiences that, you know, um, I want to, I do have ambition and I do want to pursue this, this career and I love acting so much and I am more than just a woman and um, I am more than just a wife and a mother, you know. Um, so it was, it took me a long time to realize that and um, I also sought a lot of approval from my family in the Hmong community, but at the end of the day, I realized, you know, this is what makes me happy. This is what makes me feel fulfilled. So I just kind of said, fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to move out here and do what makes me happy, you know? Um, and so um, after, like I said earlier, after I established, you know, and I wanted to reassure my, my parents that I would be financially okay, you know, because I am a Hmong girl and um, we do face a lot more um, dangers that maybe men don't face out here in Hollywood uh, as women, you know, and so once I established that, you know, they were very supportive, but initially, no, you know, because they said, oh, you're just a girl, you can't do it, you know, it's, it's too dangerous for you. Um, but after bypassing all of that, it's, it's just been a great journey and I'm so happy, I'm so happy to have the support of my family. Yeah. Um, my story is, is a little bit different, I would say, um, than, than most women's and I don't know, uh, you know, everybody's experience is different. And I understand that everybody's experience is really different. Um, I am getting started. I mean, just jumping back into it starting to act now um, at a much older age. Um, and the upside of that is that I have a, a long history of, of work with the Hmong community already. Um, and I think that's one thing that has really worked out to my benefit is that when I lived in Minnesota, I spent a huge chunk of my time in sacrificing my artistic ambitions to be a community advocate. Um, you know, so I've led rallies, I've done all the human rights work, I've, you know, represented our community at the United Nations and, and things like that. And I had developed, and for somebody like me, right, very, very honestly, um, as a Hmong woman and as an unmarried Hmong woman with a child, traditionally, I should be in the lowest class, right, um, of of being of respect, of being respected in our community for yeah. some an unmarried woman with a child. Um, and the beautiful part of this was that I had time to overcome that. I had time to overcome that before pursuing acting with all of the human rights work that I did. And I had, I've had the opportunity to sit at the same table with my father and my grandfather's 
you know, colleagues and, and sit alongside them. And they know me by name now, you know, like I'm, I'm respected by some of the most respected members in the community. Um, and they've told me even several times, um, I could tell you how many times um, some of these men have told me that don't get married. You know, don't get married. We don't want you to get married because we still need you. And, you know, we, we still need you. And, um, you know, we need you to represent us. We need your representation. And so if you get married, then we know we're not going to have the access to you that we used to. And, and for me, those were huge compliments. Um, one of our community leaders even told me one time, he used to say like, oh, you should just marry my son. You know, like a woman like you, you can't just marry anybody. You marry my son and then like, new judge, hey, come on, the computer. <laughs> so, it was the cutest thing. It was really the cutest thing. But, but to have that kind of respect from the Hmong men elderly community, and I can say from my experience, because I know not a lot of people can say this, is that I feel fully respected as a woman from the Hmong men in the community and I have to, and from the Hmong leaders, not just like random Hmong men, you know, these are, are the men that the community have looked up to and they have really given me a lot of respect, shown me a lot of respect. I've been able to sit at the side with them. You know, they call me personally um, to meetings and, but in a way that made me feel confident in my move to LA and to pursue this and to leave that behind. And I felt for a long time, I felt guilty that if I pursued what I wanted and I left the community behind to do that, I felt a sense of guilt, you know, like you yeah. felt like you're a daughter of the community. But I later on realized that if I couldn't move my own life forward, I was actually contributing to the problem because, you know, you pave the way. And if you have the capacity to pave the way and you don't, you're actually just holding your own people back. So um, Pam and Michelle, like what advice do you guys have for any Hmong girls or Hmong women that are still back in the Midwest or still with their family, like that want to pursue this, like what advice do you guys have for those, those girls or Hmong women to come out and follow their dreams? Um, my advice would be, you know, I think there's a lot of Hmong women out there that if they follow the linear timeline that is expected of us as Hmong women, which is to, you know, go to college, uh, get married, buy a house, have kids, that makes them feel fulfilled and happy, you know, and if that that's their path that they want, you know, then that, that's great. But if there's those Hmong girls out there who feel that that's not what fulfills them, and they have an idea of something else that can cultivate happiness for them, and if if acting creates joy, then I would say go for it, you know, and um, because because following your heart it sounds cheesy but following your heart and doing what makes you happy and doing what makes you glow is is going to do a lot more for you than doing what others expect for you so um that's part of one of the reasons why i'm out here too is because you know if my career does take off and and i and i get to play amazing roles you know and i'm and i'm on the screen i want little girls little mung girls all over to to see that and think okay if Michelle can do that, I can do anything I want to, too. You know, I don't have to follow this linear path if I don't want to. Uh, Pam, anything to add to that? Yeah, my biggest piece of advice would be to, um, as far as women who want to pursue this but are worried about the cultural implications, I would say that a lot of it is in your head. A lot of it is in your head. A lot of the negativity that you think you might be facing or you might be facing, because personally, I've been able to overcome it. So I know that the community is not as hard on it as you think it is, or it's, it's on your own perspective of it. I allow myself to become numb to what potential negativity there is and just do what I do because your character eventually speaks for itself. The way you carry yourself, the way you interact with your community, speaks more for yourself than what you think people are saying or what people who don't know any better are saying because people aren't really listening to the people who don't know any better. Um, and the people who do know better probably aren't saying the things that you think they're saying. Or if one person, that's, this is the crazy thing, is that sometimes one person, it takes like one person or two people out of like a hundred to make one comment for you to feel like that one comment is the the opinion of everybody else when it's not, right? It's the opinion of 
one person and that opinion can have such a powerful impact, especially when it's a negative one that you feel like that's the opinion of everyone else. And that's just not the case. You're going to find that there are more supportive voices than there are non-supportive voices. It just seems that for ourselves, we, we hear the non-supportive voices louder. Just don't allow the non-supportive voices to be louder than the supportive voices because you will have more supportive voices than you have non-supportive voices. I promise you. I promise you. So believe in that. Wait until all this come back, but Emery, so being a Hmong man uh, in this industry, like how, what does being Hmong, has it affected you in your career or, you know, or does it, you know, when you go audition, like they only, they only want Chinese or Japanese or Korean or Thai or Laos, like how did, the, how did, do you think it affected your career being Hmong and, and also just being a Hmong man who's out here pursuing your dream, like, uh, does your parents want you to get married already and have kids? And, you know, so tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yes, of course. They want me to get married and have kids. And most people, most of my peers have already, they're having kids this year. You know, they've already bought houses and they've already been settled down. Uh, that conversation always comes up whenever I visit my parents. Um, and that is, I guess that's one of the hurdles that I face is, is um, being so far away from any kind of large Hmong community kind of hinders any development in that aspect. Uh, especially if you have like, like I like how I grew up, um, both my parents are Hmong and for the most part, I grew up in a Hmong community. We had a house and uh, I had two brothers growing up. So I like that idea of family and I kind of want that for my own, but being so far away from any semblance of that um, definitely is a hurdle to overcome. Um, and as far as being a Hmong man in the industry, um, yeah, I've come across roles where I could play the type, like I look like I could play the type, but then uh, having the skills is always something, having a lot of skills as an actor is always a positive thing. So it's always gonna lend you a hand in getting a role, especially if it's like, oh, you must speak Mandarin for this role, or you must speak Japanese for this role. Um, it's very rare for them to have roles that are like Hmong specific. Uh, but I have gotten roles <laughs> where it is like, we need a Hmong speaker. And so it's not really like a hindrance necessarily, but it is a, it, it has aided me. Um, do you speak Hmong? I do speak Hmong. <laughs> um, <there's other. laughs> I speak really well, actually. <laughs> but, uh, but the biggest hurdle with that is I, I don't read Hmong Dao. That's the biggest hurdle. And a lot of stuff uh, that I have gone out for, the script is going to be in Hmong Dao. So it's like, it's, okay. It's so much easier, Hmong Dao. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to like know the vernacular, but also know how to read in Hmong Dao and like, yeah. So, so Elvis, uh, have, through your, you know, your span of your uh, career, have you felt how do you deal with bullies and how do you deal with like bullies within the community bullies of you know the competition with your peers like uh you know like how do you deal with that and this question goes to up to you guys too after elvis answer his question oh man well you know i'm i'm um yeah this is an this is, it's a thanks for the question actually it's a really interesting uh topic um i know my peers absolutely uh they you know, they hate a lot of my decisions in the sense of, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I just have too much love and passion for what I do and for my people and things of that nature. And I mean, I, I yeah, I withstood a lot of, uh, you know, criticism and ridicule. And I know you relate to this door, um, you know, but time and time again, you know, it's, it's beyond just what I love to do as a person. I think it's great, you know, that I can, uh, you know, um, be out here pursuing what I love to do and 
and have done it for so long and still be here. But yes, it is. It's these are a lot of reasons why people quit. It's the pressures from the home and the upbringings and things like that. So, uh, you know, thank you to the sisters for, you know, being brave and bold and beautiful about that because it's, it's t- I'm sure it's 10 times tougher for you guys. But I mean, I, I'm talking about I've been physically, you know, I mean, like, hurt by you know a lot of my peers i mean i've been jumped at shot at stabbed at so many and all these kind of things so many different times just for wanting to give us a name just for wanting to go out there and being that guy on a mission to make something happen for us right and for that alone i mean you can ask the questions across the board nothing cruel has come from me ever i have no enemies i have none of that i just have a lot of people that don't understand what i'm trying to do and are confused by that and either want to take away the light or 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 or, or or either, you know, want, want their own shine. And in that sense, they would have to insult and humiliate me. So why am I still here doing this, you know, all these years, you know, for our people? It's just, you know, it's simple, you know. Uh, I mean, this is just what I see. Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, we, we you know, you, you hear about the Bruce Lees and, you know, they, they've all had to lead their communities and they all had to fight their own leaders and their, their people and to, to reach where they're at. You know, like Ar- Arnold Schwarzenegger's story is really, you know, incredible with him and what he went through with his family and being here and things of that so nature. How, so how do you deal with it? Like, uh, do you just kind yeah. of like let it go or you just kind of like <laughs> let people talk or you just kind of do your thing and back of your mind is like, I'm going to prove you wrong or. Yeah. Like, you know, it is, it, 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 it's not so much a statement, you know what I mean? I, I you know, I think so, you know, success is a Swedish revenge, but revenge is never really on my mind. That's, you know, an emotional response. And, you know, I'm just not very emotional. I consider myself uh, proactive versus reactive. So if you want to see it that way, that's what it is. You know, to me, my eyes on my, it's on the main goal. It always has been. And I think, you know, people will try to shake you. And things like that. I mean, it takes a lot of self-care. You got to take care of yourself a lot, you know, uh, spiritual healing and things of that nature. And I think uh, what Pam talked about earlier, it's like psychosomatic ills. Like, you know, like we, it's not so much how people treat us. It's how we take it as well. And I think communication, the key is just really listening. And if that means listening to the universe and not so much advice from people, then you do that. So, you know, um, I take a lot of time to work on myself and make sure that I'm okay and just forgive others. Uh, more importantly, forgive myself. And um, so, you know, I, I'm just so focused on where I want to go. My plans are clear. I know exactly what I want to do. And so, you know, I, I think if you build it, they will come. And so, you know, you, you have no idea how many people have changed their minds and, and, you know, and apologize and just come to me for advice and, and, you know, and things just turn around. And I'm not saying that to be self-righteous, but, but, you know, people see it at the end, you know, of, you know, of, of, of the mistakes, you know, uh, they've done. And to me, it's just, you know, I, I just, you know, I take it with a grain of salt. It's just, uh, uh, we don't know anybody, you know, as a community, Michelle, we're, we're new to others. Uh, because you are younger than some of us, like, how do you deal with this new generation of, social media being so instant and you know like uh that that sense of the world because i know that you don't you don't really have social media but you do and so how do you deal with it from your generation since you're younger than most of the other panels and myself yeah um let's see i so i didn't have an instagram before i came out to la and i just created it because i felt like i needed to so i'm even though I'm from this generation, I don't like using it as much. It's very exhausting for me and I feel very drained. Um, So I'm kind of struggling with, you know, do I want to keep it and try to build a following so that if for some reason, you know, I'm against another actor and we're at the same, you know, we give a great performance, but which one are they gonna choose? Are they they gonna choose the one with 200,000 followers or the one with 200, you know? but I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I don't really, I don't think I would want to work with a project that is going to choose an actor based on that, you know, like they should choose the actor based on the actor that can portray the character the best, that can tell the story the most, you know, efficiently. Um, so I'm still struggling with that and we'll see, but I, I thought about deleting all of my social media actually, because I just... <laughs> Like using it. I do um, too. <laughs> I feel like it's like a necessary evil in this career. So, but I am very um, new. So I would like to know what you guys think about this. Yeah. So Pam and Emery, like, what what's your viewpoint on social media, and has it is it, do you think it's going to affect your career, and you know, or do you like it? 
Um, I'm, I'm like, uh, Michelle, like I resisted getting an Instagram for the longest time. Cause I was, I'm like, I already have a Facebook. Why do I need an Instagram? But, um, I got one for like self-promotion and, and in the terms of like, of branding and like, because for the longest time in my career, I, whenever I would meet somebody, they would see me and, and, and uh, when, you know, when you introduce yourself to somebody, they would, and meet them again later, they would remember me as, oh, you, you work in reality TV. And I, when I quit doing reality TV, I didn't want to be known as a reality TV guy anymore, you know? Yeah. So I figured I would have to leverage social media as a way to like rebrand myself and like also to get, to, to showcase my talent. Um, I have like my headshots on my social media. I have clips of projects that I've done just to like help pe open people's eyes to like what I can do, what I would be able to do, what you could cast me as, et cetera. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a tool at the end of the day. Pam? Um, so I don't hate his social media. Um, I actually like it because I'm, you know, I stay home all the time. I'm a hermit. I live far away from everybody else. I never see anybody. So because you sneeze every time. <laughs> <laughs> so social media is is a way for me to feel connected to everyone. Um, but but I've used it personally, right, as a personal way to just stay updated with what's happening to the people who are close to me um, and to let them know that I'm still alive because nobody would know otherwise. I, I've had friends who are like, you haven't posted anything. Are you still, are you okay? Because I, I you know, I'm, I'm usually home alone by myself all the time. Um, but I've never really thought to use it as a promotional tool. And I am slowly learning how important it is actually and how powerful it is. Um, and that we're getting into that day and age where websites don't even matter anymore. Right? Yeah. They used to tell you as an actor or as a performer, as an artist, you should have your own website. Nobody's going to go to your website. The reality is at this point, everybody's going to go to your Instagram um, now to, to see who you are. And they, so they can just get a quick image of who you are. Even a lot of um, casting platforms, I think backstage now as the casting platform will ask you if you have an Instagram link, um, you know, or your IMDB links. And so this is now how um, the world is getting to know you as a performer, as an artist, and especially in a day and age where we're not doing as many in-person auditions and people are having to, to figure out who they want to cast. This is how they get a clear picture of who you are. And I think it's powerful actually incredibly powerful because before when casting used to be just off of a of one headshot yeah. and that was it that was the only way you could show them who you were. you had to make sure that that headshot was everything but now people have the ability to hop on your instagram and say oh wow this person has a lot of personality or a lot of and exactly like what michelle said your following matters now how yeah. much how much value you can bring to a production how much value your presence can bring to a production now and as much as you know, it's unfair and you don't like it. It's also the way that the industry is heading, and you, you know, treating it like a business. You kind of have to be aware of that. that yeah. I mean, like it's the same thing as like back then. It was like black and white, and color headshot came in, and it's like right, right. we don't know colors going to be in or black and white, and now it's like social media. So right so now, let, your social media is your headshot. Yeah, exactly. Which yeah. is I, I come from a generation where it's just like uh i want people to just recognize me for my work my craft and how much effort i put into my career or my role and now it's like i uh, i only have like one follower it's, i mean not gonna <laughs> pass. you know what i mean it, people are almost <laughs> like who are you i mean nobody even knows who you are you're almost a nobody if you don't have a, a social media presence right so it, it's yeah. it's almost become necessary for people to take you seriously so let's dive into acting a little bit more as we step out away from you know the personal and struggles and stuff like that so i'm in the union which uh i'm in sag and aptra are you guys in the union and what are your viewpoint about the union is it a join or wait until you book something bigger before you join because it does cost money to be initiated into the union so anybody want to take a stab at that um I'll, I'll 
I'll start on that. Uh, for so long, I've been conflicted about should I or should I not. I am SAG eligible. Um, obviously, I, I chose uh, all this time to not register. And that's what, you know, most of the agents are always, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's the advice they always give you. Just hang tight, stay non-union for as long as you can so I can book you out to all this other stuff. And eventually you'll find something big enough again and it will force you to join. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sitting here and I know that I want more, you know, than, than what is given me in the non-union world. But, you know, I just keep taking that advice and, you know, uh, sometimes you just you just end up going to like shitty sets and places you don't want to be at. Like, do I want to spend the rest of my life like you know, I mean, chasing eight hundred thousand dollar gigs? That's beautiful. It's great. I'll take the money, but you know, it's like if I'm not all in, you know, um, at this point, it's like, why am I still here for? And I know when I lived in Chicago, I was paying for like uh, a workspace for two hundred and fifty dollars a month, right? So you know. Uh, given like a whole year worth of that, I, that was almost $2,000, you know, already, uh, you know, that, that I spent on that. So with that being said, if I just pay my union, it kind of becomes my, it, it kind of becomes my hub versus just being union. It gives me a space. It gives me a network. It gives me, uh, you know, kind of an incubator to work on, to spend more time in, to get more resources, to be around more people. So when I look at it that way, and I look at the treatment of union versus non-union, and I think about my value and where I want to be. At this point, even though I haven't joined, my mind is leaning a lot more to that. And even if it limits me in gigs, I'm already been, I'm like, that's already happening. So what's the point, right? So to me, you know, I mean, it's, make up your mind make a decision and go for it so for me i i i think at this point i'm chasing sag all the way um for me the i i feel like there's longevity in sag there's a lot of resources that sag offers um that non-union work doesn't um that being said there is technically a lot more non-union work out there so yes. I, I guess it just depends on where you are in your career. Like for the immediacy, immediacy of, of work, um, I feel like non-union is the way to go, but for longevity, it's, it's sag after. Right. And, and, and I hear you, but I think I just don't, you know, want to play in this bubble anymore. If, for me, it's, it's obviously most people do prefer not union, and that's great. And I think stick with that as long as you want. Um, it is you know, cool. but, but, <laughs> right. So for me, it's quality over quantity. No, it's not like I have quantity anyway. So what's the point? Might as well, you know, wait it out, play the game. And for me, try to find the highest quality gigs because, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's proven. My resume isn't really long, but if you look at the resume, everything's pretty quality on my resume. You know, so, and, and you know what, if that takes me another 10, 20 years, so be it. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm all in and that's just kind of how I feel about it. So I think it's, it's time I uh, start thinking about that again. So well, Pam and Michelle, uh, what about you guys on SAG and ACTRA and the union? I have, I don't know much. I just was told to stay non-union for the longest time until you can switch over. But um, yeah, Pam can answer. Uh, I'm, I'm union eligible, um, uh, SAG after eligible, and I like where I'm at. I like being eligible uh, because it means that if a really great union project comes along, um, you know, that I could, you know, that I could pick it up if I wanted to. So it doesn't just, it doesn't exclude me from a union project if, if something really worthwhile came along. Uh, but where I am in my career, because I, really just start literally just started um doing it again picking up again actually like going on auditions and 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 acting again it's not a good time for me because it once you are union you can't you know if you're non-union and you're eligible you can choose right you have the ability to choose yes or no but when you are in the union, you will no longer have the ability to choose. You have to only take union work and no more, like you, you can't do non-union work anymore. So that makes you ineligible for non-union work. And it's exactly like Amory said, there's a lot of non-union work out there, especially if you're a beginner. Yeah. Especially if you're a very beginner and you're still just trying to get your feet wet, um, joining a union would be bad, would be a bad choice because then you won't be able to do all of the you know all of the non-union projects and, to help, and I, to help yeah to help your yeah. craft in a sense yeah 
Exactly, exactly. And to make the, a lot of connections, to meet people, to, um, you know, and yeah, to gain the footage that you need for your reels and all of that stuff. It's, it's, you're going to get a lot of that doing the non-union stuff. Um, and so, and so it's, well, I have a follow-up question. Yeah. You guys talk about the benefits of being in a union versus like not in a union for actors. You get paid more if you're in a union because they, yeah. they like, because non-union jobs, like, so I just shot a music video for somebody, somebody's personal music video. And we had so much fun, but absolutely non-union work, right? And they just pay you whatever they want to pay you, whatever they can afford to pay you. Whereas like, if it's a union project, they're required. And, and we shot like 15 hours, right? For like a little bit of money. Um, but if you're doing a union, they're going to limit like the number of hours you can work, how many breaks you, you, so you get all of those benefits. It's almost like yeah. being. You can get triple, double enough. time. And that's good. Yeah. Good you get a way, a lot more money. <laughs> they, they limit the number of hours you can work. You get overtime. You don't get those on non-union projects. Yeah. They don't guarantee you overtime and you start to get overtime on, on, on union projects. And then I think there's, they, they have like, um, uh, they also have their own benefits. Yeah. yeah, like retirement benefits. Yes. Like Career yeah, resources right. and they, uh, workshops you can take. and Amazing great. health insurance, which I discovered last yes. year. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, not, it's not much different than workers' union, if you under yeah. that, understand that. When, when, when the workers go on strike, SAG is right there protesting with those workers, too. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's the protection, it's the uh, professionalism, the responsibility they take to assure that you get everything you want. Go, uh, going back to the word I said, value. The value of SAG is a lot different. Uh, you know, because they're 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 your best advocates, and they will fight for you. And you know, they're always there, uh, you know, as a backbone for any advice and support that you need. And it's just it's it's beyond just 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 uh, resources for the actor. It's 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 you know, it's really the principle and the philosophy of what they do. So. And with the union, just just for actors that are listening, it's it's not like you get eligible and basically you could just join. You have to kind of uh, coop up like. Now it's probably like thirty two hundred, like three thousand two hundred dollars to join, and and on top of that, every every year you have to pay your membership dues like twice a year. So the more money you you the more money you work as a SAG uh, union actor, you your your dues are more. So for example, for me when I did Mulan, I like I had to pay more uh, twice a year uh, the year that I did Mulan. So. Just it's kind of like a reward program too. You got to accumulate points to kind of actually join something yeah. like that. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's move on to auditions. Uh, how do you guys prepare for your auditions uh, for, for commercials or for film and television? How do you guys prepare oh, boy. tricks and tips you guys have for the audience that, you know, want to inspire being actors? You sound like you want to go first, Elvis. <laughs> no. No way. <laughs> You got a lot to say. I, I, no, I mean, I, I will say this, man. Don't take the rejection stuff um, um, personally, okay? This is something you got to understand. You're one out of, like, thousands of people that got selected, okay? Like, you're winning, okay? Just put it that way. I know you go into the audition. You don't get it. You think you got rejected. You, like, how did you get rejected? You got seen. So many people aren't getting seen. I think you need, we need to change our attitude about how we see this. Like, I get it. You know, you go to 100 auditions, you don't get any of it. It's discouraging. I get it. But at the same time, just know that you're in a better position than anybody else. Because casting directors, you, you'll be surprised how many times they remember me over and over and over just because I'm, I'm seen. And, 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 and they're, they're fighting for you if you don't think they are or not. Like, don't take it personal. Everyone so casting. How do you prepare for an audition? So How do I you, prepare? Yeah, so you'll be remembered by the cast director. You know what I mean? You know, I, I don't really have, I mean, I think one of you, um, I mean, I guess you all can, uh, I, I don't really have this, uh, there's always this superstitious ritual things that people do. I don't have that. I just go, I, I think I just work on me as a person and that confidence to me just, you know, like I, I think I work outside uh, of that and I just come in with it. But, but, but I will tell you how I leave. I, I don't leave thinking about what I did wrong. I don't leave wondering if I got the part. You know, like I stay busy. It's like, okay, I did the audition, boom, I feel good, I feel bad. Even if I feel bad, so what? Go on, continue your day, get the next one. I, I, I don't hang my head about this stuff at all. Gotta keep moving. How about you, Michelle? What do you do for audition? Prepare yourself. Any tricks or tips you have for these uh, actors that are interested in acting? 
Um, well, I did more commercial print modeling and acting. So for that specifically, um, uh, I make sure that I eat really healthy for that week um, so that my skin looks really great. Um, I usually wash my hair the day before so that it lo looks its best. Um, all of those things. And I drink coffee so that my face is not bloated on set, things like that. Um, but I mean, during the audition, but I think the most important thing is just getting to that state of mind as well. And just being really calm and yeah, what Elvis said, realizing that it's, it's not you, it's just that you weren't right for the job, you know? Um, so I do a lot of meditation before the audition as well. Um, but I kind of go into it playfully as well at the same time. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm here to have fun. Um, and I kind of act like I already got the job and I'm just on set performing, whatever it is, you know? So that's kind of my strategy. But Emory, the day, Emory and Pam? Yeah, uh, very similar. Like I try to have fun with it because um, that is your opportunity to act in that moment. Um, Do you wash your hair so it would be nice and shiny too? <laughs> <laughs> you shave. You always shave. Um, Give me a wax. <laughs> um, but I think the biggest thing for me is uh, I try to like uh, be off book as much as possible. Oh, God, yes. So I don't have to, so just so I don't have to worry about the words at all. And, and I'm more concerned with like what action am I playing? Um, and I try to cast whoever I'm acting with. I mean, or make up whoever it is that I'm acting with. So say... For instance, I'm in an interrogation room with two cops. Like I, and there, it's a good cop, bad cop. I try to put like, okay, so the good cop's gonna be here and the bad cop's gonna be over here. So when I'm talking to, I know who I'm talking to. Um, so when you when when you're trying to be off book, like what is what is your technique to be off book? Like for me, sometimes I would create a song with the, my lines that I have to say, you know, or, or just keep writing over and over again on a piece of paper until I get it locked into my head. What is your process? For me, I try to understand what the writer is trying to, what the point they're, the, what it, what point it is that they're trying to get across. Um, and I try to add actions to the words. Um, so say there's a scene and uh, it's between a guy and a girl and I want her to marry me. Um, I just try to like put an action to that. So what am I gonna do to like get her to marry me in the scene? Um, yeah, just break down the beats. Um, what else? <laughs> what else do I do? Um, this is going to sound so cliche, but uh, the first thing I do when I have an audition is I think about what I'm going to wear. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, 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 that's also true. Helps, uh, I think helps. about what I'm going to wear. Like, I, like I stress about what I'm going to wear. And, and I've got it now to the point where, like, I have very specific outfits that are, like, my go-to depending on the role that I'm auditioning for. Like, if I'm going for, if I'm doing commercial, this is going to be what I wear. If I'm doing like this role, this is what I wear. So that they're kind of picked out and ready to go because that's your your one chance. You have to look the part. That's that's the first thing is the minute that yeah. they see you, they have to see the person that they're looking for. Yeah. I mean like if, if that just proves the point of if you're going to audition for a homeless guy, you're not gonna wear a suit to go to your audition. So you no. have to kind of wear what know what you're wearing for kind of similar to what your character might wear. I mean, not like if you're auditioning for homeless, don't bathe for like five days and wear dirt up your clothing, which some people, right. it might work, but not not all casting directors. But when they see you, they want to see the person, they're, they want to see the role they're casting for. Yeah. You know, so you have to understand that, that you have to, because you could very well play that role very well. And we already fight stereotypes and typecast enough as it is without attempting to look like the role you're trying to play. So you have to look like the role you're trying to play. And it's not always going to require you to look your best. You know, there are times when you're going to be casual. There are times when you're going to be in a business setting. There are times when, um, you know, and, and I will I'll show up to an audition in a cocktail dress if it says, okay, you know, this is, you know, she's, she's, 
at a bar, you know? So then you have to show up in your, you know, you show up in character for, for that. And so that's, that's definitely one of the first things I do is I figure out what I'm going to wear. Also being in the, the right attire gets you in the right mood, right? The right, the, it gives you, you, you're in character when you're in the attire. Um, you behave a certain way when you're wearing certain clothes. So, um, so with, au- with auditions and now that because of the pandemic, like we're, there's a lot of self tapes. I mean, I've, I've only done two uh, this year, but, uh, but is there any points or pointers of like lighting or camera angles you guys have? I mean, since some of you guys are better camera people than I am. <laughs> yeah, I say the most important thing to light is you like, they don't really care about what's in the background. They actually prefer like a plain background because they, w- they just want to see you really, as far as like lighting and then framing, same thing. They want to see, they want to see your face. They want to see you like, don't try to like <laughs> frame half of your face or like <laughs> only a certain part, body part. Of this, were you gonna say something? Well, to add on to that, yes, be be as less creative as possible. Make it very basic and simple. Don't 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 be over the top. I mean, they'll scrap your they'll scrap it before they even look at it. Okay, so be careful about trying to do too much. There's nothing extra about self tapes. I promise you that nothing, unless it's requested of you. But yeah, the one thing I will, yeah, fancy edits. You don't have to like have the camera pan along this. No. Way. Like, leave all that to the filmmakers. You just have to worry about doing the acting part. I mean, we do Zoom casting sometimes. So just consider that. That's how simple an audition can be. It can be done over Zoom. They don't care about all the quality and stuff. Like, but it's, but you got to, you know, I mean, it's, it's got to be right. But I, the, the one thing I wanted to say was coming to L.A., right? Because it, it, this wasn't popular out in the Midwest when I was living in Chicago. Like, we got to see casting directors up front and in person, right? So I'm in L.A. I'm like, yeah, I want them to see me. Because to me, I sell me more than I sell my role. For some reason, people just love, you know, me. Like, when they see me casting directors, they get a warm feeling. They like the guy in the room more than they like the character. And I think I get booked on that a lot more, you know. And, and it's weird to say that, you know, um, whether, you know, it's the talent or not the talent. But 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 my thing is I come to L.A. and then everything's self-taped anyways. And it's not because of the pandemic. The industry's kind of just that way, period. So it, 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 it drove me crazy. I'm like... I'm not even getting into their offices now. Everything is just self-tape. I could have just done this back at home. But nevertheless, it's, it's a part of the game. I, and I had some, that was something new that I had to kind of like accept. So that was very strange. So with, with self-tape, like, uh, because sometimes when you go into an audition room, right, and the reader is so monotone and so flat, like how do you find that you can't, you know, create the world and audition correctly sometimes because sometimes it, it screws up your mind to you know when you build this character so much to the point where you're ready for the audition and the reader just sucks like how do you guys find the right reader or friend or anything you guys give notes to your friend who is doing the read with you like what are what what is your process of finding the right reader to do to help you do the self tape I feel like um uh well I, I read with myself now all right so i've discovered this self read hack so now i read with myself oh, you, for gotta my show, you gotta tell me that you gotta well so me. here's what i do right with my uh with my self my my self reads um i will because i have recording equipment and everything yeah. right so i will actually read the entire script and do a voice for the other character right yeah. so i pick a voice so that it's distinguishable and i i do it like i did this this one where I was playing with a uh, reading against a, another woman. So I actually had to just like talk really different so that I could be the other woman. But so then I did it and then I would do my part and I do their part. And then I would cut out all of my audio. <laughs> I cut out all of my audio after I read it, but I just made sure that I gave a little bit more time than necessary in case yeah. I would have to go. So then when I'm doing my self tape, I play my recording of when I was reading the other person. And then I just read with myself. So that's my hack right now, my my current self-recording hack. And it also gives me, the beautiful thing about recording that too, is that it helps with when you were asking earlier, how do you memorize it, right? So if I've recorded it that way, I'm listening to it. I'm able to listen to it over and over again, me reading against myself with different voices. Um, and 
and it helps me to remember you it gets into your mind you listen to it over and over again okay this is what's happening this is what's happening um and then also you can read with yourself over and over again to practice right so um that's kind of my hack now is i'll 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 record the whole thing playing the other character and then I just cut out the parts where I'm actually supposed to audition and then I just play the audio during my that's smart. and that's the beauty of <laughs> of um, self tape auditions now that I love that we didn't have the ability to do before is that now you can perfect your audition. Yeah. Okay? Whereas if you walk into a room and you do it once and you kind of mess up that's it, you know, um, with the self tapes you yeah. can do your best lighting. You get to make sure it's your good side. You, know? <laughs> um, you get to you get to light yourself. You get to and then you get to read with yourself over and over again until you were like, OK, this is the best take out of like for me, it's like 25 takes that I did. <laughs> and then like, OK, this is my best take. That's the one I'm going to send in. So I'll say um, that publicly. There's a benefit there. <laughs> what, what about you, Emery and Michelle? Uh, any tips on finding the right readers to help you do self tapes? You know, or, do you, or do you guys go to the same person over and over again? Go ahead, Amory. I, I recently have doing the same thing. I, I just record myself and um, there's a, a voice modulator app that I use so I don't sound like myself. <laughs> right, right. Because <laughs> um, that tends to throw, that throws me off when I'm like just talk, talking to myself. Um, so recently I've been doing that, but as far as like, if I have a reader that's not like giving me a lot, that just put, puts it on me to like really put my action through my words. So if they're, if they're like a deadpan reader and you just ha kind of have to use that to your advantage. You have to like, okay, you're a deadpan reader. So now I'm gonna use that in the scene. If you're just reading it like a dead person, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna not acknowledge that in the scene. I'm gonna use it for the, for the scene. Michelle? Uh, I haven't had too much experience self-taping. Um, you know, back when I did auditions in Milwaukee and Chicago, we would audition in front of people like what Elvis said. And so I really liked that adrenaline because it was, I had to get it right the first time in order to book the job, you know, so I didn't have time to perfect it. And so I think it was nice though, because they knew that if I got it, you know, during the audition, I would have less takes on set, which would get the job done, soon, you know, quicker. Um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't have much experience. So I'm going to take all, all of the notes that I learned from you guys today. <laughs> so Elvis kind of touched base on this uh, earlier about rejection. Michelle, Emery, and Pam, like, what? How do you guys deal with rejection? And what do you guys do, you know, during that time period of waiting to hear you book the job? to the point of you know for a fact that you got, you didn't book the job? I would say don't wait to hear if you book the job. <laughs> um, rejection is a part of the process and you just have to accept it. Like you just have to accept that rejection is, you know, they just, it's exactly what they say, like failure is the stepping stone to success. It's the same thing. Rejection is the stepping stone to getting booked. You have to accept that it's gonna happen and understand that it's not necessarily a reflection on your performance or on you, but people also want the best possible person for the role. And sometimes you're really great at what you do, but physically maybe you just don't embody what they're looking for, you know, um, or somebody comes in and is exactly that person for that role. And, and it's not necessarily because of you, you have to understand that, that um, rejection is just a part of it. You accept it and then you do it and then you move on. Like, that's what I do. You, I do it and then I just move on. I don't think about it. I don't go, did I get it? I don't wait to hear whether I got it. You just, you just keep knocking them out. You just keep going audition to audition to audition. And you just do it, just set it and forget it. You know? Like, I mean, I'm still that person where I'm like, if there's a role that I really want, I'd be like, did I get it? Did I get well, you're going Why for big <laughs> roles though. You know, I mean, you're talking about like where the level that you're at, you're talking about really big roles. You're not me trying to book like, little non-union roles and commercials and things like that. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm still going for the small roles because residual looks nice. So, <laughs> so what about you, Emery and uh, Michelle and Elvis? Do you want to add something else about rejection? Um, I don't really see it as rejection because I, it's, I rarely will get a notice to, that says we decided to go in another direction. It's usually 
not right now. Because yeah. you, you never know, because they could have loved your performance, but you, that role may not have been yours, you know? And then they're going to remember your performance for the next time they're casting something. Because I've had, I've had dozens of casting directors reach out for me to me for, to audition for something else. It was like, hey, I, I was casting this thing that you uh, came in audition for. That role has already been filled, but I think you'd be great for this other project. Um, so it's never like rejection necessarily. It's always like, not right now, maybe this other thing. Um, and as far as moving on, like there are so many opportunities to play. So you just, you just kind of have to like use every audition as an opportunity to really play. Cause that could be the last time you play that character ever. So you just have fun with it and then move on to the next one. Cause I mean, essentially we are in a freelance industry. Like all of our jobs are freelance. It's not like a corporate job where you get one job and you work that one job for the rest of your life. It's every job is freelance. Every job is, is a new opportunity. So you just have to like move on to the next one. Michelle, do you, well, how do you deal with rejection? Yeah, I agree with Amory. I don't think it's rejection at all. And I think I, I, um, I really understood that even further during COVID when I was writing screenplays because I realized I was like, okay, so it's not that I'm a bad actor. It's because I just didn't fit this role at all, you know, like, and I wouldn't tell the story and I wouldn't do it justice the way that this other character, this other person might do it, you know? So yeah, that's kind of my take on it. So let's move on to manager and agents. Uh, some people, some actors spend their whole life finding an agent and, you know, and eventually never get an agent. Like, what is, what do you guys take on manager compared to agents? Uh, for Henry? I think it's good to have a good team on your side. Uh, I didn't have representation for a very long time. Um, but also Bill Murray doesn't have representation. <laughs> well, he's Bill Murray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I mean, when you're starting out, it, it is helpful to have somebody on your side to help represent you, to help get you out on jobs and pitch you for things. Um, yeah, because having, having a team makes, makes your job a lot easier so you can focus on the, on the craft rather than uh, the business side a lot. Elvis or Pam or Michelle, any thoughts on that? I'm going to speak on the agent first and I'm going to go to the manager. I, this, is, this is how hard it is for us to book as Asian actors. Going back to what Pam said before, earlier, earlier, I do want to say that I, I have booked for general roles and I do get seen for general roles. And Kathy Byrne from SAG, uh, SAG After Chicago, you know, she really made me think about that and that I should be very, very happy about that because, you know, 90% of Asians don't book outside of, you know, Asian roles. And so to, to even have that is a beautiful, you know, quality. And so I, I, I take that very personally and, and, uh, and honor that. Um, but with that being said, it's so hard to book because, you know, I mean, white roles are, I mean, you're, you're 10 roles out of 100. Like, they're, they're way ahead of you. They're, they, get, they got so many roles under their belts that they're being seen for. I mean, I, I still have my agent from Chicago. They sent me one to Atlanta, and I have one in LA. I have three agents nationwide, right? And that's how hard it is for me to still book. So these are the things I'm talking about, how like hard it is. You got to work on you and you got to work harder than your agent. And you are your, you got to be your number one fan because, you know, I mean, once once those things fall to you, you're all you got left. And with that being said, um, uh, you know, and I love my agents. They're all great. We, we communicate well. And with the manager, to me, again, it goes back to quality over quantity. I need a manager because I'm very specific. I talked to my agent. I said, you know what? I'm not going to go off of certain roles. My Asian representation matters to me. Kids are looking at me. We're used as examples in schools. I'm not saying I'm a role model by any means, but we are used as curriculum. We are used as examples. We are used as imagery and portrayals. And so we got to be careful about who we are and we got to be true to that. So for me, I'd rather have good communication with my manager. Say, look, this is what I want. This is what I don't want. This is who I am. This is what I want to be. 
I'm not going up with all that, you know, traditional stuff. I'm not blah, blah. I know who I am and I know what I'm best at. I know what I want to put my time, my energy to. Some actors don't even get to communicate with their managers. Like, oh, yeah, I got a manager. I got an agent. When's the last time you talked to them last year? And it's like, so, you know, um, and, and it isn't about being kind and friendship and blah, blah. Like, you know, like I'm, I'm corporate minded too. I can be a shark if I want. Have that on and off switch when I need it. But the most important thing is that, you know, I, I love it when they ask you about my heritage. What are you? What, who am I? Oh, that's kind of cool. Okay, yeah, let's kind of work that to your favor. Let's, you know, I, I like managers and stuff who assess you, who want to work in your favor, and I just book you a bunch of gigs. And and that way, that's when you know, you know, like they're they're on your side. And I think it's very important to find one that you relate to. And so, uh, you know, I love all my support that I have right now. So, Pam or Michelle, agents or manager, or you have both, or you prefer one out of the other, or. You know, I, I can't speak, um, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that. So I recently got a commercial agent and uh, I really wasn't looking. So they scouted me and they found me. Um, and I, the, the goal is true though, to have a, you know, an agent that that's ideally, that's what you would want at this stage in your career. And it, it can only help you because agents have access to roles that are not open to the general public. Um, and because there are certain jobs that they're not going to put the cattle call casting out there. They are going to go directly to an agencies and say, this is what we're looking for. So uh, if you don't have an agent, you're going to miss out on the things that are specifically going through because it's, it is, everybody wants to be anybody and everybody wants to be an actor. Right. And nobody has time on a production to be going through the thousands of submissions that are coming in for a particular role. And that's really where, agents come in because it's the agents and the casting director's jobs to really screen out the people who are just not going to fit the role so that they're not wasting production's time looking at people who are not going to be able to do it or people who aren't there's also a level of professionalism that comes with having an agent right um not that you're not professional if you don't have representation but that production is going to understand that you are going there's a higher chance of a person with an agent being more pro a professional than a person without an agent because they're going to know how to show up, when to show up, what to expect, what to do, how to behave on set and things like that. Whereas like when it's a general casting and somebody, it could be anybody off the street and unreliability is the, one of the hugest things that will get you never to be able to work again in this industry because you have to understand what goes into a production and if you don't show up or if you don't show up on time, if you're not reliable, how much that screws up an entire production for the entire day, you know, if, if you're the talent and you're not on time or you don't show up. And so I think an agent, having an agent gives a production this sense of security that this is a reliable actor, right? A reliable performer. And um, so that definitely helps and it gives you more access. I don't have a manager, although I am not opposed to any of those things. I'm all for like the more people you can get on your team, the more people you can get looking out for you because they also have connections. They've been in the industry longer. They've networked longer. They, you know, and, and it's just like any other job. It's the referral basis. I mean, a lot of the out here, it's referral basis too. You're going to have a better chance when somebody who knows somebody says, hey, I got somebody for you versus being a person off the street submitting yourself. So it's kind of like a headhunter for rent, like the regular It is, jobs. it's exactly what it is. It's, it's pretty much a headhunter, um, a recruiter out there, putting you out there to the companies that are gonna hire you, yeah. yeah. Michelle, you have yeah, any no, thoughts it, on that? Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. just for um, experience in my commercial print modeling and acting, um, I just looked at all of the agencies around Milwaukee and Chicago area. And I looked at their roster um, just to see if there was anybody that looked like me. Um, and so I chose my agency because they didn't have anyone that looked like me. So then I knew that I would get more jobs that way. Um, so that's how I started out. So if you're a new actor or model and uh, you know getting your foot in the door, that's my biggest tip. That's what I would do. Look at the, the roster and to see if you would book them jobs. I mean, pretty much do your research and putting yourself out there and email and cold, cold email or call them to see if they would take a meeting pretty much. Right. And then get your headshots together and, and, and go from there. So with the transition to headshots, 
What are your thoughts about headshots? And uh, do, do you get them professionally? Or you just take your iPhone 12 and take some good pictures of yourself? Like, you know, what, what is, you know, and, and also in the era of Instagram and social media, you know, you post beautiful picture of yourself and you could use that in your headshots. Like what, what, what's your thoughts on headshots and how do you find the right photographer or, you know, have the right angles to take them? I think like you said, you just have to, you have to do your research. Um, for a long time, I would scroll through Pinterest looking at headshots and be like, oh, I like, I like this headshot. I like this style of photography. Oh. So I started a whole pin board of like all of these headshots that I wanted my headshots to like emulate. I was like, okay, I could go for, I could use this look for these type of roles or, or, or whatnot. And so, and then, you know, you find out who the photographer is and, and if they try, you know, try to book with them and if they're too expensive for you, you find a photographer who can like kind of emulate that look just to accomplish that same goal. Pam or Rochelle or Elvis? For me, um, I mean, I, I like what Emma's talking about, but that's my plan B. Um, I, I, I think, you know, my, my homework is uh, going back to what Pan said, it's re about being reliable, you know. I do my homework and I trust my agencies for a reason. So with, with that being said, you know, if, if you're the type that gets in your own way, you would make really bad decisions, that's a quality of having an agent. It's like, talk to my agent. I'll have my manager call you. That's, that's so golden because there's so much room for margin uh, or some so margin for error. And so, you know, you want to be careful with that. So with, with the headshots, it's always like, I trust my agency already. Like, that's my support system. And normally they'll find you stuff like that. And if you don't like it, then yes, take, for me, I, I would take Emory step second and be like, you know what? I think these styles, uh, you know, uh, solidify me more. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, do the homework first, trust your agent. There's a reason why you sign with them. And if you don't feel that way, then you might have to, you know, uh, start second guessing that, so. Pam or Michelle? Uh, I'm such a hypocrite because uh, I'll tell you that uh, professional, go professional 100% when it comes to your headshots, do not do them yourself. You do not, I mean, I'm, you could, and it doesn't mean that you can't take great shots. It doesn't mean that you're not a great photographer, but there's an entire craft to headshot photography. Um, a way that it's done, the way that it's lit, the way that it's lighted, the um the way that the lighting tells a story, it's, it's very specific to headshot photography. Um, and it's not about how glamorous you can be. And headshots, I think, you know, we forget that, that we feel like our, if we look good, then the headshot is good, but that's not necessarily it because we're trying to capture a personality and a character, right? We need our headshots to be particular characters and we need them to draw attention to certain things about that character, mainly the eyes. So whenever I'm looking for a headshot photographer, and I'm saying I'm a hypocrite because I don't actually don't have headshots, professional <laughs> headshots, and I still need to get them done. That's why I'm such a hypocrite. But I can tell you, like, if you're looking for headshots, um, the most important thing about the headshot is that it's about your expression and about your eyes. So how fancy your hair is, how fancy what you're wearing is your especially jewelry that has to be like to a minimal because it's not about any of that it's about the story that you're telling in your eyes and so the lighting whatever it is that you're doing has to draw attention back to right here right? it's about what's going on here and so that's the most important thing when i look for headshot photographers i'm looking for how much the eyes pop and how much, when I look at that photo, what's the first thing that my eyes go to? And if my eyes go to that person's eyes, that's the headshot photographer that I want. So that's my advice as far as looking for a headshot photographer is looking for somebody who's really going to capture your soul. What's your going soul. on right here? Yeah. Exactly right. Like the with the, with that, with that, don't use distractible backgrounds, please. Plain mm -hmm. as possible. Um, and there are three types of headshots, okay? There's, there's, there's headshots, there's a character shots, and then there's lifestyle shots of what I know of. So those are all different things that can have different bookings for different reasons as well. So you can research that. Michelle, since you just take headshots, how did you pick your photographer? Yeah, so it took me a long time. It was actually yeah, quite a long process because I, I didn't do acting and modeling for a while so I didn't really know like what my typecast was so that's usually what I use to gauge um, which photographer I choose or what kind of look I'm going for to know that okay I spent a lot of money on these headshots I'm gonna get jobs to pay them back you know 
So um, I kind of went off of that. So I, I guess I, I've been told that I can get booked a wide range from like a high schooler to a mom is what I've been told. So I kind of wanted to get a photographer that that could capture all of that, encompass all of that. But I did have one outfit where I looked more young and like a college student. Um, but yeah, I think I just, I did my research like how Amory did, um, what I wanted my headshots to look like, what I wanted to, um, you know, I, what I wanted the viewer to um, see through the photo um, and what I could bring to the table. And also, you know, I realized that these casting agents, they probably go through on their phone, like swiping, you know, like crazy on all of these um, headshots, right? But the one that really sticks out to them, like what Pam said, is the eyes and, you know, what makes you stand out. So I chose my photographer based on that um, because I didn't want too much editing or anything like that. I just wanted the best version of myself to be portrayed. Um, so yeah, that's that's the route that I went through. Well, let's gonna try to wrap it up a little bit. So um, what advice do you guys have for, you know, these these youngins who wants to be an actor or want to move to LA or uh, New York or Chicago, Atlanta? Like, why did you guys choose LA? And, you know, what advice do you guys have for them? Like being persistent, save a lot of money or, you know, ignore the bullies and, and people that are telling you no, like what advice do you guys have for these people that, these kids that want to pursue the entertainment industry? Uh, Pam, you wanna start off? Um, I think the, the most important thing if you wanna pursue this is you, you have to have thick skin. Um, you have to have thick skin for so many reasons, whether you're moving away from your family and you're gonna have to learn how to survive on your own and having thick skin is important to know how to survive on your own, but also you do deal with a lot of rejection, right? And so you have to have enough thick enough skin to, to deal with the rejection that you're going to, to, to experience and not take that personally. Um, you have to have thick skin to deal with the criticism, with the negativity that you may, you know, uh, experience. So I think learning to, learning how to numb yourself a little bit to all of the effects of that is going to make you better because being able to survive, being able to deal with rejection, because rejection is, easily what sends a lot of people running the other way because they feel like oh they're rejected two or three times that means that they're not cut out for this and they run you know and they're and they're like okay I'm not gonna I'm gonna give up because this is the industry where you never know when something's gonna happen and the people who have made it can tell you everybody has their own struggle story and even everybody that I've met whether they're, you know um, uh, living out here whether they're in this industry or not has their like survival story of their journey of that moment that they almost gave up. And it was the fact that, you know, they didn't, that got them this far. Was it like even Bruno Mars was saying like, he was ready to like throw in the towel and then go home and just forget about it. And it was like the next day he was discovered, you know? So it will get you to that point where you feel like you've got to give up and you just have to accept, um, accept that journey, right? If you're in it, to like make it big and you're here, you're going, I, I, if I'm not going to make it big and famous, then I don't want to do it. You can't think of it that way. You have to think of it as a lifestyle choice, right? Like this is a lifestyle. The rejection is a lifestyle. Not always getting jobs is a lifestyle. Being poor and broke <laughs> as an actor is a lifestyle mm -hmm. and you have to be in it for the love of the craft to, to be living that life. You have to enjoy living the life of a broke actor as much as you enjoy the fame because if you're just in it for the fame you're going to be sorely sorely disappointed and unhappy with it right you have to love it and if you love it then you're happy living the poor and broke life after lifestyle and you have to accept that it, it, it's an entire lifestyle not just fame because i think that that's what a lot of people go after they just want the fame but they don't understand they're not accepting of all of the other things that come along with it or to get there um and if your, your fame i mean not the fame isn't all of our end goals Right? But if that's the only thing, if you're going to, if you find that you're only going to be satisfied with the fame, you're not going to enjoy this. You Emery? have to, in, you have to enjoy the process. What about you, Emery? Um, I say do it and do it now. Uh, if that's, if acting is what you really want to do with your life, do it and do it now because, because you might not like it. You might have other things you want to do with your life. 
but you you're never going to know for sure unless you do it and live the lifestyle because that's such a big thing for any career like i knew when i was in reality tv working in reality tv we were casting for the show and i was just having small talk with somebody who was a possible cast member and i found out that he was a doctor he had finished med school he was in his last year of residency and he decided to take a hiatus from it because he didn't like doing the actual work. He loved studying medicine. He loved everything about it. But when it came down to doing the day-to-day -day work of being a doctor, he didn't want to do it. Um, so that's my advice is like, if you re really want to be an actor, do it now to see if it is something that you want to do for the rest of your life. Um, yeah. And if you do it now, you'll have more experience later on down the line versus waiting to, for the right moment to do it. What were you, Elvis? Any advice you have for people that want to become actors or artists? Yeah, to, to, uh, to close, I'm going to turn the attention away from acting and I'm going to turn it to the filmmakers and to my friends back at home. First of all, you know, I, 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 I know in our community, it sounds like a laughing matter that, oh, this is these actors in LA, whatever, blah, blah, nothing's gonna happen. But what I need you to understand is there's great filmmakers, people behind the scenes, you know, I'm gonna shout out uh, Abel and uh, uh, Burley Van, I'm gonna shout out Mark Lee, I'm gonna shout out Keck, I'm gonna shout out all these guys. We're, like, we're fending, we're fighting hard to get us a name and a face here in Hollywood. We're fighting the powers that be. This isn't just a yes man, we just wanna come in and be included. We're trying to really have a spot here, you know, and make a statement and be profound and prolific in what we're doing. It's a tougher fight. It's a whole nother dimension that you guys don't understand here. And I get that because you're not here and I understand that. But I promise you, it's more than just here, you know, me playing chess. Like we're really owning up to the things that we're trying to do here. And, 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 and this bigger, than what you can really imagine because you're not here to see it. But I think people here are tough as nails and we're fighting and fending for ourselves. And this is a real thing, you know, outside of that dimension, you don't see it, but I promise you just being around this little monk community here and we are small, but we're thriving, you know, in ways that most people don't even know what's going on here because we're so caught up in our communities. We have no idea what's happening out here, number one. So consider that because good things are happening. And number two, to my friends back at home, if it's not just acting, I'll tell you this, there's hundreds of different careers in the film industry. If you're a lawyer, you could be representing talent. If you're a hair designer, you could be representing talent. If you're, you know, whatever you are, a graphic designer, you're, you know, there's so many career fields. Get out to LA, get out of your bubbles. You can make twice the income, work less, right? Work, work harder, not uh, work smarter, not harder, be strategic. There's so many fields. Just, just ask us. I will tell you, you can be a chef. And you can be working and cooking on set and making triple the income. So my friends back at home who think they don't want to be actors, the film industry can be for you still. If you can find your niche of how to get in, there's so many different pockets here of industry that you can, you know, like establish your life on and quit your day jobs that you're, you're putting blood, sweat, and tears to and put it here in L.A. So that's something I want to say. It's a beautiful city. I found myself here. I, I love myself every day. And it's just come. Michelle, By the numbers. You, any advice you have for young girls or young boys that want to become actors? Yeah, I think um, just if you're uncertain, really immerse yourself into the craft, you know, so join your local community theater, um, you know, do what I did and just research and submit yourself to commercial print and acting modeling agencies and see if you like being on set, seeing if you if you like it, take acting classes. You know, and if that really fulfills you and if it's cathartic for you, like how it is for me, um, if you think about it all day, every day, and, and it's just a lot of fun, but you can't imagine doing anything else with your life, then go for it, you know? And I think the question that I asked myself before I moved out here was, if I died in five years, what regret would I have? Um, and my regret would be that I didn't come out here to be an artist. You know, so that's, that was the tipping point for me that made me, me move out here because th this is the thing that makes me truly happy. So if you can establish that, I think that all of the other things will be fine. You 
you will be able to handle the rejection and you will have a thick skin because your love for acting is going to be um, higher than all of that. So. Well, thank you guys, panel. Thank you, Michelle, Amory, Pam, and Elvis for being part of this panel because uh, after doing my panels of just me, you know, I felt like I needed the need for the, the community to understand that my, the, my journey might be different from other people's journey, other actors on his journey. So thank you so much for joining me with this panel. And thank you, uh, Pae Beer, for sponsoring this panel. And also thank you, Kat Lee, for being the man of the hour, the man behind the scene to get this together. Um, and again, any last words you guys want to say before we say goodbye to um, the community that are watching? Just Red thank love and share. Sure. Thank you, Dua. Thank you, Kat, for even putting this together and then even for inviting me. I'm like, why are you inviting me? But <laughs> you did. So, um, uh, you know, thank you so much. And to everybody who took the time out of their afternoon, their Saturday afternoon to join us. Thank I mean, you all. Thank you. You could be anywhere else doing anything else right now and you're here with us. So, <laughs> and especially these guys. <laughs> and everybody here, I got, I got all y'all back. So every single one of you, call me anytime for anything. I got y'all. Keep it strong. Emery, Emery or Michelle, anything you guys want to say? Wow, you guys said it all. Very well said. Yeah. Peace, love, and harmony, y'all. Peace, love, and harmony. Safe, guys. Stay safe. All right. Just remember to wash your hands, wear your gloves, and wear your mask. And stay safe, guys. Thank you so much and again. And, and don't go crazy. <laughs>